This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey. So tell me, muse, of that plant of many resources, which wandered far and wide the ancient plant of food, fuel, fiber, cultivated for a millennial. And as we venture through the past 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant from which cannabis derives, the plant of many uses, hemp, cannabis, ashes, cannabis and religion, cannabis and medicine, cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam. And so our odyssey begins. Today, our odyssey is not long ago and far away. It's current and in progress. And today, we are going to meet a disabled veteran, and we are going to talk about his venture with cannabis, how he got started, where he is in the process, and all of those wonderful things. So, we want to meet Sikim. Yes, Shakim. Shakim Butler. Now, first, before we go anywhere, Shakim. Tell us about that name. What is Chick? What does it mean? Shekim is actually, um, it's a biblical name. It uh, was named after Shechem, which is the first capital city of Israel and the uh, Bible. And so I was named after that. Oh, the first capital city of Israel. Yes, ma'am. After they left Pharaoh. Yes, ma'am. Oh, very good. Do we know where that is? Does it exist anymore? I'm not sure that I'm not sure. I do I research a little. Next time, let me know. <laughs> let me know. So, tell us, you are a disabled veteran. What branch of the service were you in, and what? How did you get to be a disabled? You're too young. You look too good. How do you get to be a disabled veteran? Oh, uh, the branch of service was the United States Air Force, and um, I became disabled because of training. Um, this is a, pretty much the new norm. The training change uh, from Iraq to Afghanistan meant more climbing up hills and more physical uh, training and more strain on the spinal cord and joints. So that so, is. So, so you, your, your back, your what, what happened? Um, during training, we have a lot of jumping off of uh, vehicles um, and with a lot of, with 100, 100 pounds plus gear on our backs. So uh, that weight on my spinal cord uh, during training caused a lot of damage to my disc. So they had to uh, put in screws and bolts oh. and replace discs. I have ceramic spacers. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm a machine, half man, half machine. My goodness. And so this is, then you get a medical Retirement, is that it? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I basically had to get a lawyer uh, while I was active duty and have a medical board evaluation in San Antonio, Texas, where they would uh, examine my medical documents and tell me whether or not they agreed that I should be retired or just separated. So you're retired? I am retired, ma'am. Yes, oh, ma'am. Oh, very good. Yes, ma <laughs> very good. All right. Now, so you mentioned when I heard you speak, I heard you at the Cannabis 101, and I heard you speak about all the drugs they gave you yes. and, and what that experience was like. So tell us about that. Uh, that experience was very overwhelming. Um, the drugs that they gave me were hydrocodone, oxycodone, a lot of pharmaceutical uh, narcotics that were very addictive, um, had very uh, harsh effects, you know. Um, they were very, very bad on my body, you know. And so it was a very, very, very tough time. What does that do to you emotionally and mentally? I, I understand about oh. the physicalness of, of trying to deal with pain and they give you all these things. But what's the, the mental experience, the emotional experience of having these heavy drugs? Uh, emotionally, it's 
very tough um, because you go through a lot of anxiety um, on, based upon the fact that you're not feeling like yourself when you take these drugs. You're very, uh, how do I say, spaced out and um, almost a zombie, like zombie-like. And you're not able, I have children, so I wasn't able to uh, play with my son and do normal things that I was able to do you know, and enjoy life pretty much. How long were you on those drugs? Um, I was active duty from 2005 to 2009, and so my injuries came about about 2006. So I would say 2006 to 2009 or 10 when I decided to completely rid myself of. So you were on those drugs that long? Yes. Physically, what did they do to you? Uh, weight gain was the number one thing because I wasn't able to be as active as I was before. So I. And I'm 160 pounds now, and I gained, I was at 250 plus pounds. Wow. And I've never been that big in my life. And so all of that's while you are doing these? No, yes. The, the narcotics. Oh my God. And so they just keep giving you all of that, not one, but all of those? All of them. And I had uh, lots of pills together that I would take. And at, even at one point, they had to take me off of a pill because it made me stay up 24 hours and I couldn't sleep and I had to work and this is when I was active duty so I had to work and I was a police officer so I had to arm up and I was turned You, you got a, a, a gun and you are strung out on this, oh my God. I was able, actually that day they, turned, they told me I wasn't able to arm and to go home and go see my doctor again so they could take me off of that medication so it was very, it was very strenuous. Now what about your family life? Oh, family life. During uh, that period? Uh, it was pretty tough uh, because, again, not being able to be active and to, um, you know, be happy alone, you know, with the anxiety and the stress every day of, you know, not feeling well and not being able to do things. It was very, it was pretty tough. And, so, yeah. so, now, how did you manage to go from all of that the cannabis. How did you discover cannabis? Uh, I discovered cannabis because um, now my wife was, uh, we were given orders to go to California, and California is a medical state. Now, your wife is active duty also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, and this is when I was out of the military. I was able to go active, oh, I was able to go to California. California is a medical state. And so, when I got there, the first thing my doctor. Medical cannabis. Medical cannabis, yes, okay. ma'am. And so, when I first got there, my private uh, physician actually told me that I should look towards cannabis because I turned him down when he tried to give me narcotics when I first got there. And so he said, well, this is a medical state. You should try to get your license. And that's what I did. And from then on, from 2010 to now, I've been a patient. So tell us what happened the, when you discovered the cannabis, then how did you feel? Emotionally, physically, what happened? Um, big change. Big change in my anxiety level, big change in my pain, big change in my overall living. Uh, I started to be more active, exercise more, um, just being in the mood to be more lively, going out with my family, playing basketball and all types of sports and activities with my son and wife. I became just a, a different person, much more happier. So what about the all of this medical stuff in your back, what happened? That is still there, yeah. I, I still live with the pain. I still have to, and that's the thing, I have to manage my pain now. And it's better, I manage my pain better with cannabis than I did with the pharmaceuticals you know, that they give me. And um, Does the cannabis help with the pain? Oh, the cannabis helps major with the pain. and it, And the great thing that I found out, I found out exactly how when I got my degree in psychology, when I moved to California, I found out that there's a connection between pain and cannabis and how it works specifically in uh, dulling or getting rid of the pain. And so, oh yes. The cannabinoids. The cannabinoids, yes. The cannabinoids, the terpenes, they all work together um, to help alleviate pain. And whether it be uh, in internal or topical, um, if I have, uh, say, um, spasms or you know muscle aches and it works internally and on top of the skin. So. so do you take it internally or do you rub it on your back? or Both. 
both? I do tinctures. I do uh, topical salves, What's a tincture? lotion. Tincture. Tinctures are is basically a liquid form which you place underneath your tongue because you have glands underneath your tongue. And when you uh, put, put the medicine underneath there, it gets into your system faster and works into your bloodstream faster. So that, that works for spasms, aches, pains, headaches. Oh, and then you have something that you rub on your back? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a topical lotion, a THC and CBD lotion, and uh, CBD salves uh, that I use as well. Now, so uh, that, do you ingest? the cannabis at all? Yes, um, I, I do um, smoke uh, the flower. I use vaporizer pens. Um, What's a vaporizer pen? The vaporizer pens are basically a liquid form of the cannabis and um, these can be purchased at dispensaries. Um, it's basically, it's liquid like a, a uh, how they do the e-cigarettes, but with, oh. um, yeah, but it's, it's cannabis and there's tobacco safe medicine and it, it's, Honestly, a better way of using it rather than to use the uh, fire and smoke way. It's safer, a lot safer, safer and easier on the lungs, lungs as well. Yeah, I would think so. So you don't use the smoke? Oh, I do, but not as much. Not, not all the time. I, I use tincture. I, I ver use variations of all because sometimes uh, I don't want to. I'm not, you know, in the mood to, so I like to take a tincture instead. Now... This is very personal, yes. <laughs> and if you don't, I heard, and I don't know this because A, I'm not a man, and B, I don't <laughs> use cannabis. I heard that it affects your uh, sexual life. Now, you have a wife, so if you don't want to go there, that's okay. Oh, that's perfectly fine, and I actually heard the same thing, and I um, was research. And I was researching that, and in my psychology book, there was actually a book we had to read about this. And uh, with people with my in my uh, spinal cord disorder, okay. actually have problems with those type of you know sexual disorders. And cannabis is actually something that doesn't hurt it at all. It actually helps. And um, I've actually I have children. I have I like I've been a patient since 2010 until now and it hasn't stopped me from having children. I've had two children since I've become a patient, and I'm perfectly in great health. Oh, isn't it? Because like I said, I, not being a man and not having anybody to, to ask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll put that one aside. Yes, yeah, that's We'll, we'll not forget true. that. Yes, <laughs> forget that. We, you know, we need to take a break, and we will be back in 60 seconds. And then we'll talk some more about your adventures with cannabis. Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, and we are visiting with a disabled veteran who is anything but disabled, <laughs> <laughs> and his adventures with cannabis. But first, I want to play a news clip that I found, and it is one of our regular people here on Cannabis Chronicles and in Hawaii, I think everybody knows him. And that is Paul Klink. He is 
a cannabis uh, consultant. He is also a master Red Cross volunteer. He went to Houston on a year or so ago when they had the major floods. Even though he wasn't well, and he's a cannabis patient as well as a consultant, but he went to volunteer there and set up the places. And then he went to Kauai with the flood, then to the big island with the volcano, back to Kauai, and every now and then he comes home. And now, today, he is in Virginia. So I'll ask our control room if they will run the video. from areas that have already been scorched. And this is not a movie, this is real life. These fires have killed at least 42 people, making this the deadliest fire in California's history. Local news organizations there report more than 200 people have been reported missing. More than 200,000 people had to evacuate their homes. At least 370 homes have been destroyed by the flames, and the fire chief estimates that number could double once crews get into areas that are not safe yet. But some help for those families is on the way from our area. In a story that's all new at 11, we're taking you inside the training for those Red Cross volunteers. Here's Lorenzo Hall. While thousands of families are fleeing fires in California, four different feeding routes, one group in Fairfax is ready to go in. These are Red Cross volunteers from across the country who have witnessed plenty of disasters. From Kilauea volcano that was erupting the whole time. Florida for Sandy. We have home fires. Now they're prepping for the next mission. I'm ready to go. California. California is intimidating. Intimidating because the wildfires still aren't contained. Dozens of people have died, many are missing, and thousands are homeless. I gotta be honest with you, it's scary. While the Red Cross is known for providing food and emergency shelter, this group is gearing up for a different task. I knew what to do. These volunteers are leaders in the organization and are reviewing potential scenarios they're likely to encounter, mapping out the resources available in many towns, and preparing to manage hundreds of other volunteers on the ground. The damage is However, their biggest responsibility the minute they land out west... Be there to give them a hug. These volunteers say this part of their job is often overlooked, comforting people immediately after watching their home and cars turn into ashes. And all that now is gone. Every bit of it down to the last thread of carpet or floor tile, gone forever. It's also the toughest part of the job. You will feel their pain. You really would. Now, these volunteers typically spend weeks at these disaster sites away from their own family. Some have already been deployed. Now, this particular group will finish training by Thursday and then find out if or when they're heading to California. Leslie, there is so much to do there, Lorenzo. Oh, yeah. Thank you. The Red Cross is running almost all of the shelters in California for the more than 200,000 people forced from their homes. If you'd like to make a donation, there are three ways right there on the screen by phone, by website or by texting Red Cross to 90999. That charge will appear on your cell phone bill or it'll be deducted from your prepaid balance. Wow, that is so hard to watch. All of those fires, my number one, two, three, number four son's mother-in-law uh, lived in Paradise, California, so they had to go get her. The thought of those fires is just unbelievable. Oh, okay, let's get back to today <laughs> with our guest, Sakeem Butler, and who is telling us about his venture with cannabis. Now that you have it, and you, you said that you were able to study and get your degree with much more ease. Tell us, how did that work? Oh, it works actually with uh, the cannabinoids that are inside of the plant. Um, I was actually, with certain terpenes and cannabinoids, you can actually focus better. Like, so, uh, for instance, pinene, it has uh, molecules and cannabinoids. It's a terpene, actually, that helps you focus and to, you know, really um, concentrate on what you need to do. And with that, and it alleviates pain. And so since I have a lot of pain and I need to focus, I would buy strains of cannabis flower 
that I could use as medicine and help me do these things while I would study for my degree. And in turn, it actually worked. So you got through that much simpler than you think you would have without it. Oh, most definitely, yeah, because I would not be able to even sit still, just like sitting with you right now doing this interview, I wouldn't be able to without cannabis, without being able to ha have it to medicate um, on a daily basis. You know, I, I can't pretty much do anything. It's too much pain, it's uncomfort uncomfortable, uh, and just, it's almost impossible. So now, though, now that you've, how long have you been doing the cannabis? Uh, since 2010. I've been a patient since 2010 until now and from California, uh, the state of Oregon. Um, I was a patient and a uh, patient here as well. Do you see a difference from state to state? Um, and I meant the not, regulations, the, the, the all regulation. the stuff you have to go through? Uh, yes, uh, there's a difference. Uh, state to state and getting your license, uh, what you need to get your license, how long it takes to get your license. Uh, for instance, California, you can get it same day. And I was just educated here, they're changing it now to where you can get it. And I've had my license twice here and it took so quite a while. you have to renew it each year? Yes, ma'am, you have to renew Even though you have a long-term, you're not gonna get well. No, ma'am. So. You still have to renew it every year? Yes, ma'am. And I was just educated at, uh, on s this past event um, that they will change it for Hawaii so that you can have it for three years if the doctor sees that, in my case, your, your uh, disability is not going away. Um, so that's positive that Hawaii is changing something like that because it uh, uh, could add more stress when you have to get a new card and there's a gap between getting your card and then you may run into the police or, you know, have some kind of, you, or you need to get your medicine. You can't get your medicine because of your card's expired. So, so even though you've been buying it regularly, if the card expires, you can't? Can't purchase anymore until you get a new one. So. Oh dear. Yeah, and that can leave you in limbo with being arrested, evicted, you know, by your landlord. Or, so it's good that they're changing, Hawaii's changing that. But speaking of landlords now, can you smoke in your uh, home? If but your landlord says so, if your landlord does not give you the allowance, then you can't do so. You'd have to find uh, somewhere else where you, or you can use uh, another form of Formal. medicine. To, yeah, you could, uh, the topical. tincture, what did you call it? The, the tincture, yes tincture. ma'am. Yeah, so you could all do all of those other things. Yes ma'am. Rather than, and you would get the same effect, do you think? Oh, yes, ma'am, most definitely. And sometimes you get a better effect, I believe. Uh, sometimes I, <clears throat> uh, smoking cannabis uh, sometimes can be uh, not uh, harmful, depending on what type of, if you're smoking uh, tobacco paper or you're smoking vegan, because they are, there are uh, vegan papers that you have out there, so it's not so stressful on your lungs, but it can be stressful even if you have vegan paper. So if you use tinctures and or vaporizers, that can alleviate some of the stress you have on inhaling and... I would think so. Oh, yes. I mean, while it's different than tobacco and the nicotine and the tars, yes. it's still inhaling something. Inhale, yes. So it's kind of making your lungs expand and, and that can be uncomfortable. What, now, I, you mentioned focusing and, and the, your brain and you think it does more for you. Have you, I, and I don't expect you to have a, an answer to this, but it occurred to me that would it help people with early stages of dementia or Alzheimer's, do you think? Absolutely, and I've actually- Are uh, there studies? <clears throat> research, yes, there are studies out there that show that Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, Parkinson's disease as well, it actually works as a neuroprotector um, and a neuroprotector for the brain cells. Like, for instance, Alzheimer's disease, um, it protects the brain cells. The, the, the brain cells, that there's a plaque almost that forms on the brain when you have Alzheimer's. What THC does is it breaks that plaque down and gets it off of the brain. So therefore, you can have a healthier brain and your brain is not being taken over by this plaque and forming the Alzheimer's and all, you know, everything that comes along with Alzheimer's. So it's, it's a neuroprotectant and it's good for your brain, 
Absolutely. So we're going to have to find somebody that has been through that to talk to us about what they've been through with this, or I guess early stages yes, of, what about dementia? Same, the same. It's the same. It works in the brain um, like a cleanup, cleanup job, the same way with brain, uh, with cancer. It's a cleanup. You know, it, clean, it doesn't harm the healthy cells like chemo does. It only makes those unhealthy cells commit cell suicide and then recover and become healthier. So it does helpful things to our body. Well, you know, this has been such a pleasure talking to you and learning so much because, you know, I know when we started this, which is why it's a 10,000 year journey, and every time I talk to somebody every week, I learn so much. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. Thank you. And keep up the good work. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. And we'll thank you, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.